Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome. My name is Sharon Jarvis from the University of Texas, and I am honored to chair this panel. It's the first of two in the political communication division connecting our past to our present. We have a set of distinguished scholars. To get the conversation going, I have a question for them. If they could please mention a book that inspired them when they were young scholars, and then speak to some themes that we should be thinking about in connecting our past to our present. We will move in alphabetical order, and so first we will hear from Lance Bennett from the University of Washington. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, Sharon's charge to the panel was to uh, mention a book that shaped our thinking in our careers, and then pivot from that to the past and the present. So uh, my favorite book of the many favorite books uh, is Murray Edelman's Political Language, uh, Words That Succeed, Policies That Fail. And Edelman really looked at communication discourse and effects in political context, and I think that's been missing a lot, both in the past and in the present in the field. He pointed to banal language uh, and categorization mistakes that encourage people to misperceive the underlying social context in which political problems emerge. And I'm, I'm reminded of that as I looked at a Wall Street Journal poll over breakfast this morning and discovered that uh, the majority of Americans are happy with the recent election outcomes, but also the same poll showed that five of the six majority policy hopes for this new Congress are impossible to imagine ever happening from this Congress. Uh, and so you can perhaps imagine how the disconnection between the communication process that produced these results and the uh, misguided hopes of the American public uh, might have emerged. So there's a, a moral for communication in that analysis of Murray Edelman's, both then and now, which is that discourse and the effects of discourse need to be contextualized in the political process, in the political culture uh, themselves. And I think that happens all too seldom. And because of that, we have a trouble assessing the functional versus dysfunctional communication processes we study. I think we should be prepared as scholars to really look at the functionality of the communication we, we study. A second point I want to make in my brief 10 minutes is that there's been a lag, I think, between political communication frameworks and theories and the actual communication processes in society that those frameworks purport to study. Uh, many effects models today are still anchored in the mass media age, which is gone, in case you hadn't got the memo on that. Um, and, and today, audiences are elusive. They're going online. Facebook provides a lot of news on and on and on, audiences are self-selecting the stimuli that is purported to affect them. So the question is, what happens to communication effects? We need to rethink and re-theorize communication effects, which has long been kind of at the center of, of our field. And, and a third main area of concern that I'd like to raise today is that social media further complicates the study of political communication in a couple of important ways. One is that audiences are not just consuming it, they're producing it. And so the, the line between effects and, and uh, stimuli becomes really, really blurry, uh, if, if not unimportant. I mean, I think we have such a paradigm uh, challenge in this area that we need to take it up. So that I think that, that the change in the audience process, because it's not an audience anymore, remember that? You know, the public formerly known as the audience? Well, I, I think we should take that uh, uh, reframing of who uh, we are as communicators very, very seriously. And then the, the last point I want to make because of the importance of social media in our world and broadly conceived as a sort of shift between the the group society and the network society that Manuel Castells has, has talked about, um, is that we are not just studying anymore the uh, exchange of messages, the sending and receiving of information. I think we're also looking at a huge paradigm shift 
in the role of communication itself in society and in particular in the political process. And that shift involves the move from just sending and receiving messages, that's still going on, although as my previous remarks suggest, it's going on very differently than it has been conceived in the past and continued to be studied in the present. But the, the shift is one from information exchange to communication as an organizational process. I really think that with the rise of the large crowds around the world from Tahrir Square to the Indignados in Spain, Occupy Wall Street, on and on and on, that if you, you see the organization of these crowds, what you're seeing is communication processes producing organization. And that, I would submit, is the paradigm that will guide our field for the next hundred years. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. We will stick with the program, actually, not alphabetical order, and our next speaker is John Gastel. Thank you so much for the uh, privilege and honor to join the panel today. I liked the inspiration for uh, our remarks, to think about a book that was important to you and uh, helps you think about how the field has changed. The book that was important to me is Beyond Adversary Democracy by Jane Mansbridge. And it arrived into my consciousness uh, in the early 1990s. I started uh, graduate school in 1989. And uh, when I wanted to start studying democracy at the smaller human scale, uh, hers was one of the only works I found that really spoke to that directly. Um, and in talking about uh, Beyond Adversary Democracy, I, I won't just talk about the book. I'm going to also talk about the person. Let's start with the book. For those of you that don't know the book, it's a wonderful book. Its second edition uh, is the definitive one. And what it does is, is uh, many things that I think are, are uh, great examples, models for uh, academic careers. First, it, it starts with a basic moral philosophical question. What, what is the kind of democracy to which we should aspire? Uh, you don't need to have one ideal model of democracy. David Held has shown us several different models of democracy that are functional and appealing in their own right. But she really raised, raised a, a timely question, which was, we have invested fully in an adversarial model of democracy, that adversarial clash and conflict is the primary and central function of a democracy, and it might just be that there is a contrasting norm that perhaps should be in balance with it, not to the exclusion of it, but when she finds a, a unitary model of democracy, she ultimately winds up coming to the conclusion, moral philosophically in the end, that actually we need both of these aspects, both of these elements in a fully mature democracy. So again, it starts with a moral philosophical question, which I think is so important because no matter how methodologically sophisticated you become as a political communication researcher, I would hope that at the start of the day, you keep asking yourself, what are the important questions? What needs to be studied? To what do I need to apply these sophisticated methodologies? As opposed to viewing them, obviously, as an end in themselves. And Mansbridge doesn't just start with a moral philosophical question. It leads her to empirical investigation. So if there is this unitary contrast to the adversarial model, where can we actually find it in practice? Where do you see it? What does it look like? She goes into the field in two respects. One, she looks at the New England town meeting, both historically and as an actual practice that she observes in its tedious detail. Uh, and she looks at a, uh, a civil society organization, we might call it, or perhaps a, a social welfare organization. I think she called it a, a helpline, which wasn't its real name. It might have even been in Chicago, but that's actually slipping my mind. Um, in any case, the point is they were two different organizations that had their own idea of what it might be to be unitary. For the uh, uh, social help organization, it was consensus, and they were steeped in the ideology of consensus. For the New England town meeting, it was a much more stuffy, sort of frumpy kind of unitary democracy. But in both cases, it was absolutely essential that the community come together, to find a common identity. It was less critical that it that divide along particular ideological or, or partisan lines. Um, Again, the case studies were valuable because they investigated a philosophical hunch, if you will, that went all the way back to Aristotle, that there was more to democracy than what we see. But the other thing that's valuable about those case studies is it shows you how important it is to have mixed methodologies. That is, don't just come into the field knowing that 
There's one way to study something like a social aid organization or town meetings. Come in with all the tools that, that you can imagine you might need. So she does surveys. She looks at archival data in a quantitative way. She does, of course, direct observation. She does in-depth interviews. All these things make for such incredibly rich case studies that that was, to me, truly an inspiration. Um, when I went on to do my own work, that was the model I used for a few years, was to really try to scope out a concept and then look what it is like in actual practice through these kinds of rich case studies. And in our field, we've seen that time and time again, not just at the small scale, but also at the large scale. People study things intensively, inspired by a philosophical question, in order to understand the robustness of that concept, but potentially its applicability to wider contexts. The other thing I would say about that book that I think is inspiring, and you see that inspiration in our field, is there is in it a spirit of invention. That is, her goal is not just to see what's out there, but to imagine what could be, what's possible. Uh, when the Journal of Public Deliberation was formed, Jane Mansbridge was one of many people who joined the Board of Directors, and she's been a champion of this idea of deliberation for years. As president of the American Political Science Association, I think recently, along with Carol Pateman, they both represent the ascendance in some ways of participatory and or deliberative norms uh, at the highest levels in political science. In our own field, I think it's even more powerful symbolically. The Legislative Assembly Saturday will, in all likelihood, vote to approve a new division in public dialogue and deliberation. So that's a long ways from the early 1990s, but it takes time, I think, to invent ideas, theories, fields of study. But there's an, a spirit of invention here that also gets to practical institution building. Uh, Lance, in his comments, was talking about there are new forms of communication. The, the relationship between organizations and communication may now be problematized. The whole idea of the media and the citizen is problematized through social media. Well, in the same way, uh, deliberation isn't just something you can study in the jury or, if you close your eyes, a legislative body. Um, it's also something you can imagine and you can wonder about where could we build deliberative infrastructure. After all, even the institution of the jury, venerable as it is, is still an invented institution. It was you know, highly dubious in its day, remains so in the minds of most countries actually around the world today, uh, yet countries like Japan, South Korea, now Argentina is celebrating the rapid expansion of the jury system in that country. It is something that is still new and can be invented and reinvented, but you don't have to stop there. Uh, so much of my own research has focused on these invented deliberative institutions where citizens are brought together, but Jim Fishkin and so many others in our field in political science and in so many other fields have been experimenting with over years these different deliberative ideas and institutions, and you are starting to see some of them concretized in action actual legislation, as in the state of Oregon. But my last reason why I chose Jane Mansbridge and Beyond Adversary Democracy, footnote, my, my backup choice was actually Mur Murray Edelman, the symbolic uses of politics, taken. Um, but the last reason I celebrate that book is not the book, but the person. So if you're Jane Mansbridge, uh, at that time, you've written some pretty blockbuster books. Uh, Why We Lost the IRA was a powerful book on a very important question. Um, she's continued to have tremendous uh, 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 sort of gravitas in so many fields. Um, her appointment now at Harvard gives her the opportunity to reach so many students and to reach really people in countries around the world. But she has remained throughout her life, as I have known her, uh, an incredibly humble and generous person. Uh, when you invite a scholar to a conference to give a, a, a keynote address, sometimes they land by helicopter, uh, offer their ring, and give remarks that you could have sworn you heard last week or last year or five or ten years ago, and then leave, uh, having satisfied their responsibility and ensured that their check was embossed properly. Um, I've been at more than one conference with Jane's Man Jane Mansbridge where I so looked forward to seeing her and hearing what she had to say. And she would say things, and it was a pleasure to see her, but she would get out the flipboard. She would get out the ink pen. She would start writing down what everybody was saying. She would facilitate the discussion as though she was just another person there, which of course she was, but she also wasn't. Um, she has been generous with her time uh, to a remarkable degree. When I was just a grad student, before there was this thing called the internet, um, I got this crazy idea that what if I wrote to the authors of a couple of these books? I had written to baseball teams as a child and received cards and <laughs> signed photos and bumper stickers. It was crazy. The Cardinals gave me, everyone signed a card with Lou Brock. I mean, clearly I had an unrealistic sense of the likelihood of a reply, which I've continued to use in sending out articles with an unrealistic sense of their likelihood of publication. <laughs> That has been tempered with experience. 
But Jane Mansbridge wrote back to me, wrote back a three-page letter on the question of uh, what, what would one do if one wanted to study democracy in small groups. I still have that letter. In fact, I found it just the other day going through a mildewy box that otherwise mostly had to be thrown away. Um, and it, it's such a testament to the time that someone like that can, can take, just a little bit of time, a three-letter letter. We, we can knock off a three-page letter pretty quickly, but obviously it never left my mind. And if you're curious what was the gist of the letter, it was this in a nutshell is that whatever you do to study democracy, and these are fine ideas, and yes, you should read Habermas, good luck with that. Um, remember that at the end of the day, democracy is only gonna prevail if it's good. That is, as much as we like to think that democracy is justified purely on moral philosophical terms, at the end of the day, it has to produce good results for the people living in it. And that's continued to bedevil me a little, but also kind of ground me uh, through all these years. So again, that's a wonderful book. I, I recommend it to all of you as a model for a certain kind of scholarship, but I wouldn't want you to lose sight of the fact that it also comes from a certain model of scholar. Thank you. Thank you, and our next speaker is Rod Hart. I'm at the point in life when I'm thankful for little things. For example, I'm pleased that our convener today did not use the phrase old people in the title of this program. <laughs> I'm also pleased that NCA has gotten to be 100 years old and that to date I have not. <laughs> I guess it ages on my mind today because of today's panel, but also because of what I've been thinking about lately. Here's what I've been thinking about. Scholars are now too confident about what they know and overconfidence that stifles good thinking. Social scientists have always been among the worst. Give me some raw data and a SAS program and I'll give you truth incarnate, they declare. Humanists are a little better, post-structuralism, post-colonialism, new feminism, queer theory, Bordeaux, and Zizek, all 100% correct 100% of the time. Now I understand it when 50 year olds spout such bromides since they're 20 pounds overweight and their tennis game sucks. Linear regressions and Jean-Francois Lyotard can help compensate for such deplorable conditions. But 25-year-olds should be more transcendent. They've got better bodies after all, and they've uttered far less foolishness heretofore. But youth too has its demands. Give me something, anything, says the new doctoral student, something to make me sound authoritative, a sage to which even the gods must genuflect. Not in my class. So I spent the last month <clears throat> peddling the seductions of humility to nine doctoral students. So what's your term project about, I ask? Well, in my paper I want to argue, says she. I'm going to call into question these received truths, says he. Just help me find something I can count, says a third. My response is always the same. These are interesting possibilities, but let's start by asking what you don't know. Tell me what you're curious about, the things that confound you. Share with me the uncomfortable mysteries of your life. My students hate me for asking such things. They want instant street cred, an efficient new authority, a quick line in the resume. Occasionally, though, there are victories. I met recently with a student I'll call Alex. A young man as smart and as thoughtful as they come. The two of us went around his barn for 15 frustrating minutes and I kept asking, what is that you don't know? What difference will it make if you know it? Suddenly the penny dropped. Alex uttered a conundrum on his own time and his own language. Yes, I replied, that's precisely what you don't know. Now let's talk about how you can know it. Then Alex smiled, deeply, broadly, satisfyingly. This was not the smile of arrogance. It was the smile of ignorance. Alex had fallen in love with his own question and it empowered him. Then he smiled once more. What does all this have to do with the past and present of political communication? Everything. I don't believe that we can go forward until we regain our deepest curiosities. In this subfield, but in all subfields really, we're lulling ourselves into an early senescence. The social scientists among us are building schemas of news diffusion, of elite partisanship, of media and diaspora, well before it's time to build schemas. Big data researchers are modeling social media content even though their textual descriptions are bankrupt and even though big data techniques were invented last Tuesday and social media utilities last Friday. 
Rhetorical scholars are in a hurry too, trying to turn the first word about hegemonic resistance, Lacanian psychoanalysis, third world doxologies, and quantum feminism into the last word. But trust me, as a longtime journal reviewer, it is hard to find questions in these studies, never mind a genuinely, genuinely curious auteur. The received literature has become a straitjacket for such scholars. So here's a thought experiment. What if we started a new journal that prohibited footnotes and scholarly references? Would you submit an essay to such a journal? Would the sound of nothing but your own voice unnerve you? Would you have anything to say once your stomach had quieted? You would, I suggest, if you had real questions about matters beyond your kin. You would if you had a new story to tell, one that did not cantilever off other people's work. You would if you were mystified. I think of myself as a pragmatic phenomenologist, one who learns best when the world becomes odd. A key goal of phenomenology is to make the familiar strange, to, take, to examine the taken for granted, the there but unnoticed. This is an especially useful approach when studying politics because politics is old and so apparently knowable. Let's call the roll. Voters have never been more partisan than they are today. Republicans will control the House forever. Millennials will never visit the cherry blossoms in DC. We all live in information cocoons. The mass media are no longer masked and the ground game is everything. All of Barack Obama's critics are racist. Texas will be read forevermore. John Stewart is our savior. So many truths, so much assurance, so little evidence, so few questions. It is time to make the familiar strange. And here's how to do it. Go to the library and check out Political Language and Oratory in Traditional Society, edited by Maurice Block. I read this marvelous work in 1975, the year after I received tenure. It changed me in important ways and it emboldened me. The book is a collection of 10 sumptuous essays written by cultural anthropologists who traverse the globe asking what political spe speech making looks like in Bali, Madagascar, Kenya, and in the island of Tikapia. They attended political rituals among the mercy of East Africa, the Maori of New Zealand, the Melpa of Papua New Guinea. These were exotic tales for me, but they taught me much about American politics, about things I knew but did not know that I knew. Block's book shows how formalization of speech becomes an adjunct to power, how political codes can strangle dialectic, but also how subtle language experiments can signal changing power dynamics. Political ceremonies, I relearn, can ward off innovations of, uh, invasions of ex expertise and keep political rivals in their places. But political virtuosity can also shift things if the right rhetorical strategies are mastered. Block and his colleagues show how calmness and refinement in public discussions cements a tribal culture, but also how detailed knowledge of speech norms can be quite powerful, perhaps explaining how the Mitch McConnells of the world acquire their influence. Veiled language, ambiguous language, is especially powerful in face-to-face -face culture. But figurative speech also produces bounties unless the wrong family of images is invoked. The researchers show how ideology becomes encased in words, how multiple codes play across and against one another in all cultures, and how winding speech, roundabout speech, experimental speech, helps people get political work done. Finally, Block and his colleagues remind us that in institutionalized cultures, listening to another's first words often leads to our accepting their last words as well. The worst way to treat, uh, approach Block's book is to treat it as something foreign, something primitive. It is far better to treat it as, some, as a go to self-understanding, as an invitation to rethink what we know about ourselves and our times. The study of political communication desperately needs such goads. As I read the journals, we, are far now far too, uh, we now know far too much about not enough. We become trapped in serial orthodoxies. Our research questions have not been basic enough, and our scholarly conclusions have been far too conclusive. We need to be better domestic anthropologists. We need to make our world strange once more, questioning our presuppositions and everyone else's verities. We need to be braver and perhaps even snarkier. Perhaps there is too much patriarchy in politics these days, but perhaps there's also a lot of muddling through. Perhaps everyone is setting our news agendas, but perhaps there's no everyone, and perhaps there are no agendas either. Maybe there's more political incivility to be found nowadays, but maybe we've forgotten that politics has always had rough edges. Maybe political opinion is more easy, easily manipulated today, but maybe the art of public opinion polling itself is now at its dotage. 
Maybe presidential authority has been radically eclipsed, but maybe it is now so atmospheric as to be undetectable with traditional methods. Maybe social media are changing political folkways, but maybe everyone on Twitter is irreversibly, irredeemably batshit crazy. <laughs> so it is time to be bold, but also time to be humble. A sure way of finding your humility is to use the field's forebears to measure your own work. For example, if you recently completed a set of political interviews, you might ask if Ralph, Pl Rain, uh, Ralph Lane would be impressed with what you found. If you've done a new critical analysis of Marco Rubio, you might ask if Edwin Black would raise one of his lofty eyebrows when listening to your paper. If you succeed in identifying a radically new rhetorical formulation, you might ask if Marie Hopkins Nichols would be muttering to herself, been there, done that. And if you've recently completed one of those fancy online experiments, you might ask if Jerry Miller or Tom Scheidel would be impressed with your sample selection, treatment stimuli, measurement tools, and real world fidelity. Voices from the past can be daunting, but they can be a kindness as well. The political world is ever new, ever old, so it'll take one of Hillary's villages to understand it all. Our village, the NCA village, is a good candidate for doing so. Represented in our group are humanists and social scientists, and that is a blessed thing. But to make real progress, we must fall back in love with our questions. Our scholarly journals need more life than they have at present, more people struggling with ideas and fewer people trotting out other people's ponies just because they've been ridden before. I, for one, will keep asking my students to be as curious as they were when they were five years old and to delight in what they do not know. I wish that same dastardly fate upon all of you as well. Thank you. Thank you, and our next speaker is Mary Stuckey. I'm not grateful that I get to follow that. <laughs> so the book that I chose in response to Sharon's prompt is um, The Rhetorical Pre Presidency by Jeff Toulis, and of course also the essay by Toulis and his co-authors. Partly this is because they focus so clearly on institutions and I, as an institutionalist, found my way to rhetoric through them, but also because I think that they are profoundly wrong in a lot of their conclusion. And so the wrongness of what I thought they were saying was, for me, a powerful bait into the um, profession. I sort of get off on wrongness in so many ways. Um, so it's pretty great to be on a panel with these folks, and I want to thank Jay for putting this all together and specifically for including me. And I'm also grateful, along with my colleagues, that I'm allowed to be in the present when I do feel a little bit like the past. Um, what I want to do here, then, is to characterize the past just a little bit and talk about how that constitutes a challenge for us in the present. I've been around political comm for a pretty long time as it's practiced in both political science and communication. And the thing that distinguishes it for me from the other subdivisions in which I'm also involved is its agility. Um, as my colleagues here have noted, we're a pretty nimble bunch. Our subfield is qualitative and quantitative and sometimes at the same time. It exploits insights from sources as wide ranging as Plato, the behavioral revolution and cultural studies. Political comm scholars focus on texts that go as far back as ancient Greece and that appeared on the internet a minute ago using methods that I think can be both in innovative and imaginative. Political comm research is at its best is informed by the kinds of concerns that the humanities struggle with and with attention to the empiricism from the social sciences. It pays close attention, I think, to the situatedness of communication in institutions, in history, in culture, and also looks for ways to address issues that transcend a single case. I think the best political comm scholars ask the big questions. What is the relationship between institutional structures and the process of politics and citizen, em citizen empowerment and or alienation? What is the role of political culture in that relationship? When we investigate questions of individual and group psychology, engage in institutional analysis, and examine political processes, from the macro and the micro level, I think we are doing our best work. And it requires us to be a pretty nimble bunch. I think we're very good at elections. We are very, very good at the components of elections, debates and ads. We're better at understanding or arguing about the role of humor in popular culture. And I think that this agility is what has always characterized this field for me. 
But I worry a little bit that we tend to rely on what we already know and focus too much on elections and the things that come with them because they're so very tidy, right? And we kind of love tidiness. Um, I think the best thing about the present is the way that we are now going to be forced to get beyond that. And so I want to give you a quick example. Last summer I was involved in uh, conversations with film scholars and popular culture scholars and political scientists and social movement scholars about the protests in Thailand, the ones that followed the coup and featured the use of the uplifted hand, you know, with the three fingers from the Hunger Games. I had not actually watched the Hunger Games, so I was mostly puzzled by what why are these people like doing a version of the Boy Scout oath? <laughs> My junior colleagues were convinced that I really need to get out more. Um, it was obvious to most of these scholars that this was a really interesting moment. It entailed the appropriation of an American film or novel, a popular culture icon to ends that were neither about the United States or popular culture simply understood. It was an effort to appropriate one audience for entirely different purposes, and it was an effort to expand an audience and to capture another audience. Perhaps most interestingly to me, it involved using a symbol that at the end of the film novel is incomplete. The three-fingered hand gesture was in the film, as in Thailand, a clear gesture of defiance aimed at a ruling elite and its institutional order. But by the end of the novels, I am told, sorry if this is a spoiler, the revolution has not been successful. It's ongoing and open-ended. This one very simple gesture, therefore, is enormously complicated. And it's exemplary, I think, of the kinds of communication that I see more and more often. And frankly, I don't have any idea how to even begin explaining it. Like, I don't know what theories to use, what combination of methods. I have no freaking clue how to examine this. So th this is my challenge to you. Um, because this is not qu quite the kind of media convergence that Henry Jenkins talks about. It clearly involves issues of circulation, but it's not confined to those issues. It's about race, it's about class, but not in anything that looks to me like simple ways. I think it's obviously about globalization. Okay, that doesn't help. And civility and democratic deliberation. And it's an example of what Goodnight talked about at the recent public address conference as refusing the literal. So rhetoric has a place in this conversation too. And while I've been impressed and inspired by past work in political communication, much of it by the scholars who are on this panel, no one of these literatures gives me a satisfactory way to understand this kind of phenomena. For me to even describe the layers of meaning here require insights from film studies and popular culture and political science and audience and circulation and, 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 and. The only place where those insights are routinely possible to combine is in this division. And I want to suggest that the more work we do that does this kind of combining, the better off we will be. Michael and I talked about this a few months ago when I saw him at APSA, and we agreed that both of the, we both these days tend to pose questions rather than offering answers, the benefits of age. And so I want to pose a challenge. I think it's imperative that we engage right now in ways that resist the siloing of research and endlessly replicating studies. We need to find ways to address and understand how political communication occupies a central space in politics and how politics increasingly infiltrate all of our forms of communication. And I think we need to do so by relying on this division's inherent agility. Thank you. Thank you, and our final speaker is Michael Della Carpini. So I too want to thank the organizers of this panel uh, and uh, my fellow panelists. I was, my first reaction when I was asked to do this was feeling extremely honored. Um, there was a certain backhanded compliment nature to being asked to talk about the past of the field of communication, but I got over that really quickly as, um, as our, the fellow panelists have. I want to walk through a little bit the process that I went through when Sharon suggested that we organize the panel around thinking about particular pieces of work that influence us when we were younger scholars. Uh, I found it a, a, a very interesting exercise, and a number of books came to mind almost immediately. 
Uh, I just want to mention some of them before I talk about the one that I selected. Ben Bagdickian's Media Monopoly, Joshua Meyerwitz's No Sense of Place, Herb Gans's Deciding What's News, Eric Barnow's The Sponsor, Todd Gitlin's The Whole World is Watching, Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death, Murray Edelman, who keeps coming up, um, Symbolic Uses of Politics. Any of those could have been um, volumes that I had selected, but in the end I decided, cheating a little bit, as I told Sharon, to use a, an edited volume because it allowed me to bring in more authors. The first edition of the uh, volume Culture, Society, and the Media, edited by Michael Gurevich, Tony Bennett, James Kern, and uh, Jeanette Woolcott. Um, I was an assistant professor in my second year, I think, of uh, teaching in a political science department. I was teaching a um, new course in media, politics, and democracy that the political science department there decided that they wanted to offer and that I was happy to suggest. Um, the book itself, for those of you who don't know the early edition, has come out with other essays over time is broken down into three sections, one on class, ideology, and media with essays by the editors themselves and by Stuart Hall, a section on media organizations with, again, some essays by the editors, but also those by Murdoch, Gallagher, and Boyd Barrett, and a section on media power, or what we might call media effects and influence, with essays by James Curran, Bloomler and Gurevich, uh, Tony Bennett, and others. So. For those of you who know anything about my own work, they may seem like a strange list or and a strange final uh, uh, um, uh, choice. Uh, my work, I'm not trained in those areas. I'm trained as a political scientist in a Midwestern political science department that was very much um, quantitative and statistics oriented. And in fact, most of my work over time has been quantitative and statistically oriented. So why did those books become the books that came to mind immediately after asked by Sharon to think about books that influenced me. Well, one of the reasons is because I was trained as a political scientist, and I was increasingly interested, even as a graduate student, in the role of the media. But as a political scientist, the, there were limits, constraints that I felt, not entirely. As John mentioned, uh, political science can also claim folks like uh, Jenny or James Mansbridge, uh, so this is not a, um, a truism, but in general, the methodology of political science had, was, was uh, identified, constrained in a certain way, though valuable. I want to continue to make that point. The notion of what constituted politics, as Mary mentioned, um, was uh, clear and constrained by and large the study of governments, elections, uh, and participation in those forms of politics. Um, and the role of communication or the media was quite constrained, often a variable in a larger equation, mm -hmm. an important variable, something that people cared about within political science, but never the center of attention. And reading the books that I mentioned and the collection that I mentioned in particular as someone not steeped in communication, sociology, anthropology, uh, the, uh, the Birmingham School, the Frankfurt School, uh, the, the British uh, approach to the study of uh, communication and media more generally, it was eye-opening and liberating for me. Not completely new, because these were issues I, that were percolating in my head, but um, uh, authenticating, if you will, legitimizing, if you will, and opening my mind to a variety of ways in which one could think about the study of media and politics. That included the expansion of the concepts that I, was, that I cared about. What do we mean by politically relevant media? What do we mean by politics? What do we mean by influence? Because my area of study is the effects, if you will, of, um, of media and communication. An expansion of the objects and levels of study to think even if you're interested ultimately in the influence of media, understanding that to understand that you need to engage in everything from the institutions of communication through the messages themselves. The standard kind of notion that I still come back to of what constitutes the communication process. It gave me a critical perspective, a realization that one could use even the techniques of, of quantitative social science um, that have very strict rules as how one studies something and what constitutes evidence, but have no rules at all as to what the thing is that you study. And that's a liberating notion, something that we forget. Um, 
and also the centrality of media and communication to the things I was interested in, not as a variable alone, although in part that, but also as a uh, central form of study uh, and, and topic or subject of such study in and of itself. It was really, I think, at that moment, although slowly, I began to move from someone who was defined as a political, defined himself, identified himself as a political scientist, to someone who identified himself very consciously rather as a social scientist, to someone over the last 11 years who has defined himself as a communication scholar. That uh, journey uh, included working with uh, James Carey, Bob Shapiro, Ellie Noam to start the communication PhD program at Columbia University where I got my first full flavor of what it meant to be in communication. It involved eventually coming to the Annenberg School for Communication uh, so that my identity was more formally that of a communication scholar. But it also included my identity as a member of the various subdivisions of political science, of the ICA, and especially of the NCA in the political communication division. Um, and uh, what I realized is that there are many elements of the field slash discipline of communication that make it amenable to the kinds of issues that we all care about. One of them, and these are going to be familiar to you, is its multidisciplinary roots and its continued multidisciplinary approach, its multi-method roots and its continued multi-method approaches. Um, all of these things make it uh, much easier to explore, to ask the kind of questions that have been uh, raised here on this panel, uh, to feel as if one can let what you're interested in leads you into a variety of different directions without somehow leaving the tribe. Having said that, as a somewhat outsider, an immigrant for 10 or 11 years, I will also say that I chose the words multidisciplinary and multi-method um, pointedly because I think, as I've been in this area uh, longer, we really are siloed that we are open and ecumenical in allowing within the field or discipline a variety of approaches, but the interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity of the field slash discipline could be a lot better than it is, I think. And so um, I think we are at a current moment where we are unbelievably well positioned to address the issues of the 21st century that have communication at its core, both as teachers and as researchers. As teachers, I think we could make the case that the liberal arts, that communication is at the heart of the liberal arts, much like people could make the argument that maybe rhetoric and rhetorical studies was at the heart of the liberal arts. That's still a part of what we do, but I would argue that as uh, teachers at liberal arts colleges and research universities, we should make a greater claim, if you will, on the, our role in the liberal arts at the core. But secondly, in terms of research, it's my experience uh, dealing with uh, uh, many of my colleagues in the social sciences and humanities that every field whose central purpose is to understand the human condition is realizing that communication plays some kind of a central role. It's almost amusing to watch folks in other fields think that they've discovered things, as I did as a young assistant professor, that have been the topic of inquiry by folks in this room and in this uh, conference for decades. And so we are there, again, I think well positioned to add real value to the study of almost any substantive area that's studied in anthropology, sociology, political science, history, and the other disciplines, that uh, um, uh, comparative literatures, and the other disciplines that we uh, uh, consider our sister disciplines and many of us kind of emerged out of. But I will say that we are, well, in order to take advantage of that well positioning, we need to really begin to communicate across the various subdivisions and silos, if you will, that I feel are too strong. And one of the ways to do that has been suggested by several of the people on this panel, that is to problematize things, to ask questions, to understand what we don't know, and to model some of our, the things we study in terms of communication processes as we talk across fields, across subfields, even within our own uh, discipline and field. So I, I'm going to end with a little bit more optimistic note than some of what we've heard. There is a little element. I mean, I, as I mentioned, I felt a little funny about being on a panel that was kind of 
uh, the, the gray beards coming to, no offense, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, talk about what the field used to be, um, even though the present is still uh, present in the, t in the title. Um, uh, but you do get a certain level, I think, of curmudgeonness, I think modeled mostly by Rod's great comments here, <laughs> which I think is a natural, a natural thing when you've been in any area for a long time. You begin to see the cycles of it. You begin to see the repetitions. You begin to see the fault lines. You begin to find it harder to see what, where the enthusiasm and energy is. The only point I'd make is that for all of us on the panel and for the audience is that I think what's really important to, to model what Rod said by even questioning ourselves as to how much of that is out there and how much of that is in here, right? Um, but I will say I see some opportunities here, and I'll just mention a couple of them. First of all, I think the political communication division is one area. ICA, NCA, AP, APSA, when I go to the political communication um, uh, panels and I go to the um, business meetings, there is an intersection that goes on. Not perfect, not always the, the same, but there isn't commingling of people from different parts of the, who are interested in the study of politics and communication that I find extremely satisfying and that I think we can build on. At the APSA um, last summer, there was a pre-conference on the qualitative study of, of uh, political communication organized by young scholars, really promising young scholars in the field, and, and, an, a, and a, 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 um, a pre conference that was completely um, uh, uninterested in the qualitative versus quantitative debate. But that simply said, hey, we got some really interesting things to study right now. How do we study it? And there was um, no kind of defensiveness, it was a mingling of different approaches that I thought was incredibly inspiring. Uh, the fact that James Curran and Shanto Iyengar can work together to uh, take a critical studies approach uh, to, uh, uh, with empirical quantitative data to help understand what kind of information environments at an institutional level are most effective at getting people to be informed about politics at an individual level. Um, the work of, um, of, uh, that's going on to uh, another conference that I attended at the University of Delaware that was designed to um, bring together quantitative, qualitative, and mixed method scholars interested in the, in the blurring of entertainment and politics that brought together works that seldom speak to each other and people that seldom speak to each other. Um, I could go on, but I think you get the point. I, I don't want to be Pollyannish about this. I think we have a huge amount of um, of work still to do, but I'm quite optimistic in this moment that we have where the media environment has changed dramatically in ways that were mentioned, and as a result, force us to do what Rod suggested, which is to talk about what we don't know if, we, if we're sensible. I think we have a great opportunity um, uh, to uh, not only um, invigorate our field, but to really add value to democratic processes, so thank you. Thank you very much. We now have some time for questions. This session is being recorded, so I anticipate that a mic will be passed around. No. Uh, so uh, we we'll will. Repeat. I think we we're supposed to repeat the. Terrific. Question. Okay. So if we have questions, uh, please raise your hand. We will repeat the question, and all of our uh, panelists are mic'd. That's a great question. Uh, since I didn't take more than half of my time, I'll answer it. Uh, I, I think there are a lot of, of structural problems with discipline, although I agree with Michael that, that we have opportunities given the diversity and the richness of the interdisciplinary associations to overcome these things. I, I also like Rod's idea of the journal with no citations because I do think that citations compel us to look backwards. 
and, and, and there are classics that need to be cited in, in sort of the headwaters of, of every field. So, and, and, and core courses that tell you what you th must do in order to be successful uh, in a scholarly way. So, so and not, not that we can overcome those things because they're part of our scholarly tradition. So, so I guess there's a tension that I would say we should maybe examine and, and, and open up for young scholars uh, more transparently between paying dues to the past and problematizing the present and, and the future in, in asking interesting and creative questions. So, so there should be, I think, some uh, look at our core courses and problematizing the um, literatures that we are in danger of reifying. Uh, the, the worst mistake a scholar can make is to reify concepts and, and use them as blinders to not see emerging trends in society and communication. You know, there's something about uh, those of us who review for journals. I, you know, a lot of times when I'm not on a board, I still am asked to review something. I just go back and look at the bibliography, and then I know why I've been asked to review the piece. And, and there's a logic to that, because mm -hmm. I have a particular expertise that the editor thought was relevant to the piece being submitted. On the other hand, I got a set of biases that go with the things that I've done before that that descend upon that author. So I'm just hoping that, that the editor has sent the piece out to, that, to people that are nowhere cited on the bibliography as well to, to see if they can engage the interrogative uh, in more, more richly than perhaps than, than I might because I've already done something in this area. So I think there are structural things that happen associationally that get in the way sometimes of clearing space. Yeah, I think that's right, and I think it also has to do with the way we teach as well as the way that we operate professionally on that more uh, journal publication level, because one of the things that we always do in seminars is ask students, how, like, how does this fit in with the ongoing conversation in the field? Right? I mean, that's like the, I don't see how this connects to a conversation. So a student or somebody trying to start a conversation still has to find something to, I think the verb you used was cantilever, which I thought was really terrific, right? But if you, you think about your work as a way to pivot from instead of cantilever off of, like that's sort of a more imaginative approach, I think. I, I would just say I actually don't think we're in as bad shape as we could be. Uh, for a few reasons. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, I, I mean, I, a few of us have mentioned we've, yeah, yeah, yeah. At, to some degree, existed at the intersection of a couple fields. For many of us, it's political science and communication in this field. And I, it was an unconscious choice to go into communication. But as I kept walking through life with my peers in political science, much more tightly constrained in terms of what is American politics. What are the books you must read? The syllabus on this course at this university, the same course at another university, very similar, relative to the field of communication. This was a source of tremendous anxiety in this field when I was starting graduate school, that we had no identity, we had no history, we had no great works, and there would be people who would argue about that. The point is we argued about it. It was a fair question. Um, so I think we started with a little bit of an advantage. Maybe it was a liability, but it was an advantage. Um, and when you look at political communication in NCA versus political science, I, I, I still see that difference in yeah, terms of the fair. heterogeneity so. here. Uh, also, it's that, I mean, communication has always been a, an interdisciplinary field, but this division of it, I think, remains wildly interdisciplinary. I mean, our, our flagship journal is an interdisciplinary journal, political communication. There's one other advantage, a little, little slimmer, but I want to really emphasize for younger scholars thinking about the arc of their next 10 years, which is um, uh, communication scholars in many subfields don't publish a lot of books. And some they do, but even in rhetoric, you don't necessarily publish four books over the course of your career. That's not that common, I, I'm told, and it seems to be confirmed. Um, in this division, it's not uncommon. I don't know how many books you've published, Lance, but it, it, he's not the only one. Um, you know. I, it, Folks here, I mean, I look around this table, I mean, there's a lot of books being produced. And it's not that, hey, books are exciting. Um, the point is, my uncle once put it to me this way. He said, oh, I'm so sorry that got rejected. It should really find a way into your next book. Um, and his, his point was that maybe you're wrong, but in the book you get to make the full argument. 
And the argument can go much farther than the blind peer reviewer. The, and let's be blunt, the book publishers want to publish books they want to publish. And it doesn't ha have to do with what the reviewers said in that sense. They, they get excited about the idea in a way that a journal editor is, is much more constrained. So in books, you get to make a full-throated new argument. I mean, I, you think about some of the things these people at this table are famous for. It's partly for an argument from a book where they really said something that changed how people thought. So I think we have more of a tradition of that in political comment, and I think it's a healthy tradition. And again, 10-year arc as a young scholar, you can think about how your ideas might lead to something like that, which makes a stronger statement than the first few articles that get you a job. Yes. So the question is, uh, if social media have changed the communication process, so how, how, how do we factor that in? How do we study it? And how do we reconcile it with the past yeah. research, which is largely based in a mass media tradition? Um, good question. Uh, it seems to me that we have different media systems in play at the same time. And that's challenging, interesting, but also difficult to study. So we shouldn't forget the fact that there is, I mean, I guess the, the, the buzz term for this is the echo chamber media, so that you have a lot of different media inputs that somehow uh, bounce around society uh, unevenly, and, and, but people do hear distant echoes from other parts of the media sphere. So, so better conceptualizing that simple but I think useful concept would be one move that you could make in your dissertation perhaps. Um, another thing that, that I would just say as a cautionary note is that in studying social media, don't just pick one. Uh, you know, I, I like Facebook. I'm, I'm going to study Twitter and Occupy. Um, you, you know, figure out why you're picking it, not just because you could get the data or because it seems interesting intuitively, but theorize your interest so that you force yourself to sort of look at the media ecology. I, I, I begin to hear people talking about media ecologies, and I think that's an important but also very slippery uh, approach, but one that points in a good direction. And, and looking, when I mentioned the idea that, that communication paradigms are not, not just being re replaced, uh, but also added to uh, with the idea that communication is an organizational process. You know, that sounds intriguing, but it's very complicated when you really start looking at how social media organize crowds, for example. Uh, and the, the, the bottom line and the end of my response to you is to really locate your social media in the ecology in ways that help you understand how it is working with other platforms and other people in, in the crowd um, to produce certain kinds of organizational outcomes, whether it's distributing resources, helping crowds respond to external events, or reformulate themselves as they uh, mature or die off. So all of those things, I think, are parts of models that, that need to be better developed. But the, the good news is, I think, and I share in this sense the optimism of everyone on the panel, with perhaps uh, the exception of Rod, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that these are challenges. They're, they're happy challenges. And, and uh, I commend them to you as a uh, next generation. Other responses to this question? Yeah, I just want to say that I think that the, um, the the impact and how we understand the digital media environment, the media ecology more generally, including social media, I think it forces us to do some of what Rod described, if we're at all reasonable. One is that it forces us to say, well, what don't we know? Because mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, it's hard to pretend we know on, the, on this. Um, and I think the second thing, it forces us to be more like anthropologists, ethnographers. I think what we need first and foremost is not what's the theory and how do I um, uh, uh, deduce what I think is happening from it. I think we need to be much more 
engaged in thick description and inductive um, grounded research. Mm -hmm. And I say that as someone who comes out of a tradition that doesn't <laughs> approach it that way. Michael, I, I'm, I'm going to rat you out to the people yeah. of Wisconsin. <laughs> well, we're, on, we're, we're being uh, oh, video yeah. streamed. Fortunately, I don't think there's a lot of people watching. So, um, but, uh, and I, but I think that we, you know, that, that to say, okay, you know, the, the debate, do we apply our current theories or do we come up with new theories so we can understand it is way too premature. Um, and I think that applying our current theories forgets. It's, it's really interesting to me how theories that we questioned and debated before the rise of the new media environment, we are now treating as if, well, they really worked before, but now do they work anymore? We forget they didn't work all that well oftentimes before, that things were much more complicated. <laughs> mm -hmm. And secondly, that we feel as if our mission is to really quickly decide which of those theories still apply and what new theories we have to develop without knowing the object that we're studying, which mm -hmm. is in flux and which is really, really complicated. Yeah, and I want to add one thing to that too, which is that one of the things political science does do, which is interesting here, is divide things differently as to whether you're studying an institution like the presidency or Congress or a process. Yeah. And one of the things that's interesting about political comm is sometimes we get fixated on the media as institution and forget that it's also a process. Mm. And so getting to questions of circulation and movement and the ways in which the echo chamber, to the extent that it is, actually work, and who is echoing who and on which terms. Thinking about media less as an institution and more as a process, I think might be That's one of the ways yeah. to do that kind of yeah. thick description that forces us to ask us ourselves what we don't know. That ties to we we add uh, an, an example uh, that will advance the curmudgeonly uh, <laughs> perspective, and that has to do with big data approaches to text analysis. Um, I agree. New phenomena, social media, you'd think that thick description would be the very first move. Um, for many people, it is not the very first move. The very first move is to find a machine that will chop it up and, and throw as much as you can in there, and then forget that you've thrown language into the machine because really what you all want to do is now you want to manipulate the numbers that came out of the machine. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an exemplar of that, I, I ask you to <laughs> go to conventions, as I do, and go to big data panels and see how quickly they get from the first sentence to the regression. Um, and then ask yourself at the end of the paper if you've heard an example of, the, of human discourse even once during the presentation. Um, and my guess is you will not in many, many, many cases. And I think that's just abominable and it's an insult to the human condition. So there. So there. I, I guess I've got a bit of a pragmatic question. Several of you mentioned mixed methods. In training students, I find myself in conflict with the idea that I think mixed methodology is wonderful, and yet I feel for them to get published, they have to become experts in a small methodological area to prove themselves. How do we balance that? How do we teach mixed methods in a way that is, allows a young scholar to build a career? So I have strong feelings on that. Um, and, uh, and the question is, how do you, you, you know, it's easy, my words, to, to preach mixed methods. Um, but in fact, how do you do that, especially given that you, it, there's some skill sets you have to learn and to be expert in a variety of methods is really hard. So I think three things about that. One is um, that you need to at least engage, uh, know enough, and this doesn't take a lot of work, to be able to engage the literature that mm -hmm. uses other methods. You don't have to be expert in it, but you've got to see what they're doing. Um, secondly, I'm a strong believer, and, and this is where institutional um, uh, behaviors come into play, that work increasingly should be collaborative, multi-authored, um, and we should respect that as being as hard or harder than individually authored work. Mm -hmm. And third, I think, as we often do, we exaggerate the degree of skill set and intelligence one needs to master more than one method. You know, it's not rocket science. 
Uh, you know, you can, I mean, I, you get better with time. It's, I don't want to understate that, overstate that. But in fact, um, one can be, in fact, pretty good at more than, more than one method, especially if one also has colleagues that are doing it. So I want to add a friendly amendment to that with you 100%. And then when you hit the dissertation, or especially the dissertation proposal, you may see a particular method that you want to well, become expert important. in. Yeah. Go for it. Uh, so it's that broad base. But part of the point is you can't get to point B if at point A you don't actually know what your choices are. So that's when the specialization, I think, makes great sense. Hopefully you can come back out of the other end of the dissertation remaining curious about lots of different methods, but now you really know structural equation modeling because you needed to do it for your dissertation. Or you now understand uh, ethnographic observation at a whole other depth than you did when you went in. And I think people respect that because it shows how far you can go with a single method, but you still have that broader base. Yeah, and in a sort of another friendly amendment is that <laughs> careers aren't events. <laughs> I, I keep coming up That's with process, point. right? But if you think about what's the really big question that I'm interested in, you're not going to answer that question in a dissertation right. or in an article, right. or at least I've never been able to do it in a book. But what you can do is take different pieces of it, and you've got an arc that develops over a really long time. And if you've got an interesting question, then you always have a different way to come at it. And so you don't necessarily have to do mixed methods in one piece. Right. Like it's right. equally valid to do mixed methods over time yep. across an arc to keep coming at the same object or set of objects or questions from different angles. And you can do that over a career in a way that some people may be intimidated by trying to do it at a dissertation or for an essay. And you can do it with a variety of co-authors. So if you think about it not as an, a, a, like a project, not as a thing, but as a, a set of questions that animate you over time, then there's no reason not to go mixed methods. And, and Mary's point makes me want to make my own friendly amendment to my own suggestion, <laughs> which is that, um, that we, we need to think about this as a subfield as well. So, yeah. so it's not, you know, mixed methods can also mean I do my regression equations, uh, Rod does his uh, close readings and discourse analysis, um, that we talk to each other in public it, through, through, uh, through the, our publications, through commentary. We don't take nearly enough advantage of the new information environment and the way we think about publishing our work um, in terms of not just the public, it's not the publishing of it, that's the first step. That's not the end of that debate, right? And, and we should be taking much more advantage of the ability to make that the starting point for a conversation across some of the different approaches. And to add to all of these lovely comments, um, great question, because I think it kind of connects back to the very first question that, that was asked this morning. I find, mainly from reviewing articles, that very little research gets contextualized. In fact, worse than no context, people often let the methods and their concepts tell the story rather than use methods and concepts to reveal something new or interesting about the social or political process they're trying to study. So you, you see these articles where the narrative arc is really a conceptual and methodological arc rather than a revealing uh, story about the, the, the question uh, about society or politics. And so I think that what can happen in a methods class is to remind students to contextualize what they're doing, <coughs> putting it back in society. And that's where I, I agree with Maurice Block as a wonderful sort of starter book for, for, because anthropologists do that. I mean, they didn't always do it well, and there have been a lot of paradigm battles in, in anthropology, of course. Uh, reification is, is everywhere. But uh, the, the, the contextualization process reminds us that we need to figure out how to narrate and put discourse and people back in our, our, our stories that may be methodologically driven stories in any event. So contextualization gets us to ethnography, gets us to qualitative methods, and to not making hard distinctions between quantitative and qualitative methods. Or, for that matter, use mass media for their own purposes to communicate. 
some kind of ideas or like to influence other nations in its views. I'll take a first shot at it. I, I, mean, I don't do international communication work. Um, to, to me, the, the, whether it's comparative communication or international communication, international communication meaning both communication among and between nation states or between uh, individuals and groups and organizations within them, that that's as much the future of the field as is the emphasis on digital and social media. That, um, what, as, uh, I'll confess in my own work that you know, as somebody who studies American politics and American political communication, we, when I re review articles, if it's a study that's uh, either international or comparative, it will always begin with this is in the context of these nations, this region, this particular mm -hmm. relationship. If it's a study that's about American political communication, nope. that's completely absent. It's about, right. this is about communication. This is how it right? works. This is how it works. <laughs> yes. um, and I think that, um, that we can no longer, th it's, we have to be thick-headed to not see how that's not the way we need to think about this anymore. So I see the international, in my, from my own personal point of view, the comparative, um, as, the, as a big part of the future of the field. Because it just gives you more uh, points of reference. It's, it goes back to Rod's point about you know, what's so valuable about uh, some of the anthropological work is, it, is that it forces you to, be on the, uh, to, to realize you're looking at something that's foreign, that you don't understand it. Yeah, and I think globalized communication, like with my example from the um, Thai uh, protests, like, I don't think that we can afford to not understand the ways that things are circulating globally, both from us and to us and around us. And I have no clue how to start that, but that needs to be figured out because I think it's increasingly clear that it's fundamental. I, I think we have to confront uh, challenges both uh, in terms of the, uh, the practices in different uh, countries and cultures, uh, but also the, what is sort of morally desirable within the context of that culture. And so the example I give is uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party has declared that its path to democracy in you know, the next 10 year plan is deliberative democracy. And uh, they're going to have a big conference about this in China and create centers for democratic deliberation that will practice this. Um, uh, to some, that might sound sort of hilariously cynical and, uh, you know, gobbledygook. Uh, you know, what on earth does that mean? Uh, well, that's the language they're going to choose to appropriate on their path to a new softer, gentler authoritarianism. Um, but there's no getting around the fact that China has actually now hold, held several deliberative polls which are actually authoritative where random samples of citizens, and the response rate is shockingly high, uh, when they're invited to participate in these. Uh, they're actually given a tremendous latitude of authority. They make decisions, and they're implemented. That's not what happens here. They're just recommendations to government which says, thank you for your time. Um, so that's really happening, and it's really useful to Chinese officials. Well, what does that mean? Well, did they deliberate in the, is it in the same sense we mean? Uh, should they be subject to the same, if we agree on the same moral philosophical goal, do we now have to use the same practices? But do we have to agree on the same moral philosophical goal? Of course, the joke in China would be if they, if they did arrive at deliberative democracy, it would be deliberative democracy with Chinese characteristics. <laughs> um, so, right, so what does that mean? Right? So I think when we talk about international political communication, we have to not only let go of the fact that the American model isn't the model, but we don't even know what the sort of moral philosophical good is necessarily or what it would look like to implement it in that cultural historical context. So may, we may be in the age of the internet of everything, but we're also in the internet of every culture. Two, uh, <clears throat> two thoughts. <clears throat> One, um, I think you would, if you were at the ICA convention, you would find a, a great deal more international work yes. Than, yes. than at NCA. Absolutely. Um, the other side of that, people are vexed that, that, uh, that we look at the, the US as the, as the center point for all of this sort of thing. My greater vexation is that we are completely unselfconscious of the Ameri Americanicity of American political communication. I don't think we. I don't think we're very good domestic anthropologists of hmm. ourselves, and I think that's so much more. That that is as much a frontier as understanding what's happening in Thailand. In my in my opinion, I think we're that naive 
and, uh, and unreflective about mm -hmm. American political processes from a cultural point of view. Uh, wonderful. Please join me in thanking our uh, panelists for their thoughtful and wonderful presentations.